Xylo Productions presents in its affiliate stations, starring Logan Gregor in Orson Welles' The War of the Worlds by H.G. Wells. Ladies and gentlemen, the director of this adaptation, Logan Greger. We know now that in the early years of the 20th century, this world was being watched closely by intelligences greater than man's, and yet as mortal as its own. We know now that as human beings busied themselves about their various concerns, we were scrutinized and studied perhaps almost as narrowly as a man with a microscope might scrutinize the transient creatures that swarm and multiply in a drop of water. With infinite complacency, people went to and fro the earth of their little affairs, serene in their assurance over their dominion of this small, spinning fragment of solar driftwood which by chance or design man has inherited out of the dark t mystery of time and space. Yet across an immense imperial gulf, minds that are to our minds as ours to the beasts in the jungle, intellects, vast, cool, and unsympathetic, regarded this earth with envious eyes, and slowly and surely drew their plans against us. In the 39th year of the 20th century came the Great Disillusionment. It was near the end of October. Business was better. The war scare was over. More men were back at work. Sales were picking up. On this particular evening, October 30th, the Crossley Service estimated that 32 million people were listening in on radios. For the next 24 hours, not much has changed in temperature. A slight atmospheric disturbance of undetermined origin is reported over Nova Scotia, causing low-pressure area to move down rather rapidly over the northeastern states, bringing a forecast of rain accompanied by winds of a light gale force. Maximum temperature 66, minimum 48. This weather report comes to you from Government Weather Bureau. We take you now to the Meriden Room at the Hotel Park Plaza in downtown New York City, where you will be entertained by the music of Ramon Raquello and his orchestra. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Ladies and gentlemen, we interrupt our program of dance music to bring you a special bulletin from the Intercontinental Radio News. At 20 minutes before 8, Professor Farwell of the Mount James Observatory, Chicago, Illinois, reports observing several explosions of incandescent gas occurring at regular intervals on the planet Mars. The spectroscope indicates the gas to be hydrogen and moving towards the Earth with enormous velocity. 
Professor Pearson of the observatory at Princeton confirms Farrell's observation. He describes the phenomenon as, quote, like a jet of blue flame shot from a gun. We now return you to the music of Ramon Raquello playing for you in the Medirin Room of Park Plaza Hotel situated in downtown New York City. Ladies and gentlemen, following on the news given in our bulletin a moment ago, the Government Meteorological Bureau has requested the large observatories of the country to keep an astronomical watch on any further disturbances occurring on the planet Mars. Due to the unusual nature of this occurrence, we have arranged an interview with noted astronomer, Professor Pearson, who will give us his views on the event. In a few moments, we will take you to Princeton Observatory in New Jersey. We return you until then to the music of Ramon Ricello and his orchestra. are now ready to take you to Princeton Observatory at Princeton, where Carl Phillips, our commentator, will interview Professor Richard Pearson, famous astronomer. We take you now to Princeton, New Jersey. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. This is Carl Phillips speaking to you from the observatory at Princeton. I am standing in a large semicircular room, pitch black except for a huge split in the ceiling. Through this opening, I can see the sprinkling stars of the night sky that are casting a frosty glow over this amazing mechanism, this huge telescope standing behind me. The ticking sound you hear in the background is the vibration of the clockwork. Professor Pearson stands directly above me on a small platform, peering through the giant lens. I ask you to be patient, ladies and gentlemen, during any delay that may arise during our interview. Besides his captivated curiosity, of his watch of the heavens, Professor Pearson may be interrupted by telephone or other communications. During this period, he is in constant touch with the astronomical centers of the world. Professor, may I begin our questions? At any time, Mr. Phillips. Professor, would you please tell our radio audience exactly what you see as ob you observe the planet Mars through your telescope? Well, nothing unusual at the moment, Mr. Phillips. A red disk swimming in a blue sea. Transverse stripes across the disk. Quite distinct now, because Mars happens to be at the point where it's nearest Earth, in opposition, as we call it. In your opinion, what do these transverse strips signify, Professor Pearson? Not canals, I can assure you, Mr. Phillips. That's the popular conjecture of those who imagine Mars to be inhabited. From a scientific viewpoint, the stripes are merely the result of atmospheric conditions normal to the planet. Then you're quite convinced as a scientist that living intelligence as we know it does not exist on Mars? I'd say the chances against it are a million to one. And yet, how do you account for those gas eruptions occurring on the surface of the planet at regular intervals? Well, Mr. Phillips, I can't account for it yet. By the way, Professor, for the benefit of our listeners, how far is Mars from Earth? Approximately 40 million miles. <laughs> Oh, that seems to save enough distance. Thank you. Just a moment, ladies and gentlemen. Someone has just handed Professor Pearson a message. While he reads it, let me remind you that we are speaking to you from the observatory in Princeton, New Jersey, where we are interviewing the world-famous astronomer, Professor Pearson. One moment, please. Professor Pearson just pa uh, passed me a message which he had just received. Professor, may I read the message to the listening audience? Certainly, Mr. Phillips. Ladies and gentlemen, I shall read you this telegram addressed to Professor Pearson from Dr. Gray of the National History Museum, New York. 9.15 Eastern Standard Time. Seismographs registered shock of almost earthquake intensity occurring with a radius of 20 miles of Princeton. Please investigate. Signed, Lloyd Gray, Chief of Astronomical Division. Professor Pearson, could this occurrence possibly have something to do with the disturbances observed on the planet Mars? Hardly, Mr. Phillips. 
is probably a meteorite of unusual size, and its arrival at this time is probably a mere coincidence. However, we shall conduct a search as soon as daylight permits. Thank you, Professor. Ladies and gentlemen, for the past few minutes, we have been speaking to you from the observatory at Princeton, bringing you a special interview with Professor Pearson, noted astronomer. This is Carl Phillips speaking. We are returning you now to our New York studio. Ladies and gentlemen, here is the latest bulletin from the Intercontinental Radio News. Toronto, Canada, Professor Morse of McGill University reports observing a total of three explosions on the planet Mars between the hours 7.45 p.m. and 9.20 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This confirms earlier reports from American observatories. Now near home, we have another breaking news story from Trenton, New Jersey. It is reported that at 8.50 p.m., a huge flaming object, most likely to be a meteorite, fell on a farm in the neighborhood of Grover's Mill, New Jersey, 22 miles from Trenton. The flash in the sky was visible with a radius of several hundred miles, and the noise of the impact was heard as far north as Elizabeth. We have dispatched a special mobile unit to the scene, and we will have our commentator, Carl Phillips, who's in the area, give you a word description as soon as he can when he reaches there from Princeton. In the meantime, we will take you to the Hotel Marinette in Brooklyn, where Bobby Miletti and his orchestra are offering a program of dance music. We take you now to Grover's Mill, New Jersey. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Carl Phillips again, out at the Wilmoth Farm, Grover's Mill, New Jersey. Professor Pearson and myself made the 11-mile journey from Princeton in 10 minutes. Well, I hardly know where to begin to paint a word picture for the strange scene that's going on from my eyes. It looks like something out of a modern fairy tale. Well, I just got here. I haven't had a chance to look around yet. and I, I guess that's it. I can see the object that fell from the sky. I, I guess that's the thing directly in front of me. It's half buried in a vast pit. It must have struck with terrific force. The, the ground is covered with splinters of a tree. It must have struck on its way down. What I can see of the object itself is it, it doesn't look very much like a meteor. It's not like the meteors I've seen. It, it honestly looks more like a, a huge cylinder. It, uh, it has a diameter of... Uh, what would you say, Professor Pearson? Uh, what's that? Uh, oh, Professor, what would you say... What's the diameter of the object? Um, uh, about 50 yards. About 50 yards. The metal shield on the sheath is... Well, I've never seen anything like it. The color is uh, sort of red and green. The curious spectators are now pressing close to the object in spite of the efforts of the police to keep them back. They're getting in front of my line of vision. Hey, give me a second. Hey, would you mind standing to one side, please? One... Thank you. While the policemen are pushing the crowd back, here's Mr. Wilmoth, owner of the farm here. He may have some interesting facts to add. Mr. Wilmoth, would you please tell the radio audience as much as you remember of this rather unusual visitor that dropped in your backyard? Step closer, please. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Mr. Wilmoth. Well, I was listening to the radio. Uh, closer and louder, please. Uh, uh, pardon me. Oh, louder. P please, closer. It's all right, sir. Y yes, sir. I was listening to the radio and kind of drowsing. That professor fellow was talking about Mars, so I was half dozing and half... Yes, yes, Mr. Wilmoth. Then what happened? As I was saying, I was listening to the radio kind of halfway. Yes, and you then saw something, Mr. Wilmoth? 
Well, not at first. I heard something. Uh, what did you hear? It sounded like a hissing sound, like this. Like a 4th of July rocket. Uh, then what? Turn my head out the window and would have sworn I was asleep dreaming. Yes, I saw a greenish streak and then zingo. Something smacked the ground, knocked me clear out of my chair. The animals started to panic in the barn. Well, were you frightened, Mr. Wilmoth? Well, I, I ain't quite sure. I reckoned I was kind of shocked and riled. Thank you, Mr. Wilmoth. Thank you. Want me to tell you some more? No, no, that's quite all right. That's plenty. See ya. Ladies and gentlemen, you've just heard Mr. Wilmoth, owner of the farm where this thing has fallen. I wish I could convey the atmosphere, the background of this fantastic scene. Hundreds of cars are parked in a field in the back of us. We are trying to rope off the roadway to prevent more from heading into the farm, but it's no use. They're breaking right through. Car's headlights throw an enormous spot on the pit where the object's half buried. Some of the more daring souls are now venturing near the edge. The silhouettes stand out against the metal sheen. One man wants to touch the thing. He's having an argument with the policeman. The policeman wins. Uh, now, ladies and gentlemen, there's something I haven't mentioned in all this excitement, but now it's becoming more distinct. Perhaps you've caught it already on your radio. Listen. Do you hear that? It's a curious humming sound that seems to be coming from inside the object. I'll move the microphone near. Now, we're, we're not more than 25 feet away. Can you hear it now? Oh, oh, Professor Pearson! Yes, Mr. Phillips. Can you tell us the meaning of this scraping noise inside the thing? Possibly the unequal cooling of its surface. I see. Do you still think it's a meteor, Professor? I don't really know what to think. The metal encasing is definitely uh, extraterrestrial, not found on this Earth. Friction with the Earth's atmosphere usually tears holes in the meteorite. This thing is as smooth as can be, and you can see it, uh, kind of a cylindrical shape. Wait, 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 just a minute, just a minute. Let's see what's happening, ladies and gentlemen. This is terrific. The end of the thing is it's beginning to flake off. The top is beginning to rotate like a screw. It must be hollow. She's moving! The dark things are screwing! She's top the top loose, ladies and gentlemen. This is the most terrifying thing I've ever witnessed. Watch it! Watch it! Watch it. Something crawling out of the hollow top. Someone or something is peering out of a black hole. Oh my god! Two luminous discs. Are they eyes? It might be a face. Good heavens, something's wriggling out there like a gray stick. This is the most horrifying thing I've ever witnessed. Oh, there's another one, another one, another one. They look like tentacles to me. There, I can see the thing's body. It's, it's as large as a bear and it glistens like wet leather. But that face, ladies and gentlemen, it's horrifying. It's indescribable. I can hardly keep myself to look at it. The eyes gleam black and like a serpent. The mouth is V-shaped with saliva from its limb lipless lips that seem to quiver and pulsate. The monster, or whatever, is having a little bit of trouble moving. It's going pretty slow. It seems to be weighed down by possible gravity or something. The thing is raising up. The other crowd is falling back now. They've seen plenty. This is the most extraordinary experiment. I, I can't find any words. I'll pull this microphone with me as I talk. I'll have to stop the description until I can take a new position. Hold on, will you please? I'll, I'll be right back in a minute. We are bringing you an eyewitness account of what's happening on the Wilmoth Farm, Grover's Mill, New Jersey. We return you now to Carl Phillips at Grover's Mill. Ladies and gentlemen, am I on? Oh, ladies and gentlemen, here I am, back at the stone wall adjoins Mr. Wilmoth's farm. From here, I get a sweep of the whole scene. The crowd has moved back at least 100 feet away from the object. I'll give you every detail as long as I can talk, as long as I can see. More state police have arrived. They're drawing up a cordon in front of the pit, about 30 of them. No need to push the crowd back. Now they're willing to keep their distance. 
The strange creatures that were seen must be some kind of extraterrestrial race. I can't believe it. Humanity's not alone in this universe. After um, the broadcast stopped briefly, they um, moved back into the uh, object and have not come back out ever since. The captain of the police is conferring with someone. We can't quite see who it is. Oh, yes, I can see it now. It's, I believe it's Professor Pearson. Y yes, there he is. And now they've parted. The professor has moved around one side, studying the object, while the captain and two other policemen advance with something in their hands. Oh, I can see it now. It's a, it's a white handkerchief tied to a pole. Flag of truce. If those, creature knows, if those creatures know what it means... Wait. Well, something's happening. A shape is rising out of the pit. I can make out a small beam of light against a mirror. What's that? A, a huge... A, a huge tube is flying out of the pit. It's on a giant arm. A metal, a metal arm. There's a jet flame spring from the mirror. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, due to circumstances beyond our control, we are unable to continue the broadcast from Grover's Mill. Evidently, there's some difficulty with our field transmission. However, we will return to that point at the earliest possible opportunity. In the meantime, we have a late bulletin from San Diego, California. Professor Idol, speaking at a dinner of the California Astronomical University, expressed the opinion that the explosions on Mars were most likely nothing more than severe volcanic disturbances on the surface of the planet. We now continue with our piano interlude. Ladies and gentlemen, I have just been handed a message that came in from Grover's Mill by telephone. It's disturbing news. At least 400 people, including six state troopers, lie dead in a field east of the village of Grover's Mill. Their bodies burned and distorted beyond all possible recognition. The next voice you will hear will be that of the Brigade General Montgomery Smith commander of the state militia in Trenton, New Jersey. I've been requested by the governor of New Jersey to place the counties of Mercer and Middlesex as far west as Princeton and east to Jamesburg under martial law. No one will be permitted to enter this area except by, except by special pass issued by the state or military authorities. Four companies of the state militia are proceeding from Trenton to Grover's Mill and will aid in the evacuation of homes within the range of military operations. Thank you. You have just been listening to General Montgomery Smith, commanding the state militia at Trenton. In the meantime, further details of the horror at Grover's Mill are coming in. The strange creatures, after unleashing their deadly assault, retracted the metal arm holding the strange weapon attached to it and crawled back into the pit and made no attempt to prevent the efforts of the firefighters to recover the bodies and extinguish the fire. Combined fire departments all over the county are fighting the flames which menace the entire countryside. Many homes have been destroyed. We have been unable to establish any contact with our mobile unit at Grover's Mill, but we hope to be able to continue to return there at the earliest possible moment. 
In the meantime, we take you to... Wait, just a moment, please. Yes? Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I've just been informed that we have finally established communication with an eyewitness of the tragedy. Professor Pearson has been located hiding in a farmhouse near Grover's Mill, where he has established an emergency observation post. As a scientist, he will give you his explanation of the calamity. The next voice you will hear will be that of Professor Pearson, brought to you by Direct Wire. Professor Pearson, you're on. Of the creatures in the rocket cylinder at Grover's Mill, I can give you no authoritative information, either as to their nature, their origin, or their purposes here on Earth. Of their destructive instrument, I might venture some conjectural explanation. For want of a better term, I shall refer to the mysterious weapon as a heat ray. It's all too evident that these creatures have scientific knowledge far in advance of our own. In my guess, the weapon in some way is able to generate an intense heat using blazing hot light in a chamber practically absolute of non-conductivity. The intense heat they project in a parallel beam against any object they choose by means of a polished parabolic mirror of unknown composition, much as the mirror of a lighthouse projects a beam of light. That is my conjecture to the origin of the heat ray. Thank you, Professor Pearson. Ladies and gentlemen, here's a bulletin from Trenton. It is a brief statement informing us that the charred body of Carl Phillips has been identified in a Trenton hospital. Here's another bulletin from Washington, D.C. Office of the Director of the National Red Cross reports 10 units of Red Cross emergency workers to have been assigned to the headquarters of the state militia stationed outside Grover's Mill, New Jersey. Here's a bulletin from State Police, Princeton Junction. The fires at Grover's Mill and in the vicinity of the area of the cylinder are now under control. Scouts report all quiet in the pit and no sign of life appearing from the mouth of the cylinder. And now, ladies and gentlemen, we have a special statement from Mr. Harry McDonald, Vice President, in charge of the operations. We've received a request from the militia at Trenton to place at their disposal our entire broadcasting facilities. In view of the gravity of the situation, believing that radio has a responsibility to serve in the public interest at all times, we are turning our facilities to the state militia at Trenton. We take you now to the field headquarters of the state militia near Grover's Mill, New Jersey. This is Captain Lansling of the Signal Corps, attached to the state militia, now engaged in military operations in the vicinity of Grover's Mill. Situation arising from the reported presence of certain individuals of unidentified nature is now completely under control. The cylindrical object, which lies in a pit directly below our position, is surrounded on all sides by eight battalions of infantry. Without heavy field pieces, but adequately armed with rifles and machine guns. Three tanks are here. All cause for alarm, if such cause ever existed, is now entirely unjustified. The things, whatever they are, do not venture to poke their heads above the pit. I can see their hiding place plainly in the glare of the searchlights here. With all the reported resources, these creatures can scarcely stand up to intense heavy machine gun fire. So I can guarantee to the public that, at least at this point, they are safe. But you should still maintain an evacuated area around this area until the situation is neutralized. Anyway, it's an interesting outing for the troops. I can make out the uniforms crossing back and forth in front of the lights. It almost looks like a real war. There appears to be some slight smoke in the woods bordering the Milestone River, probably fire started by campers. Well, we ought to see some action soon. One of the companies is deploying on the left flank. A quick thrust and it'll all be over. W wait a minute. I see something rising out of the cylinder. Wait, like, no, it's nothing but a shadow. Now the troops are on the edge of the Wilmoth Farm, several thousand armed men closing in on the old metal tomb and 
and wait, it is in the shadow. Something's moving, solid metal, kind of a shield like a fair rising up out of the cylinders. It's growing higher and higher. It's it's standing on three legs, actually rearing up on a sort of metal framework. Now it's reaching above the trees and the searchlights in a hold on! Hold on! Hold on. Ladies and gentlemen, I have a grave announcement to make. Incredible as it may seem, both the observations of science and the evidence of our eyes lead to the inescapable assumption that those strange beings who landed in the Jersey farmlands tonight are the vanguard of an invading army from the planet Mars. The battle which took place tonight at Grover's Mill has ended in the worst defeats ever suffered by an army in modern times. 7,000 armed men with rifles and machine guns pitted against a single fighting machine of the invaders from Mars. 120 known survivors. The rest drew over the battle area from Grover's Mill to Plainsboro, crushed and trampled to death underneath its metal feet or burned to cinders by its heat ray. The monster is now in control of the mill section of New Jersey, and it is now on a rampage, effectively cutting the state through its center. Communication lines are down from Pennsylvania to the Atlantic Ocean. Railroad tracks are torn and destroyed, and service from New York to Philadelphia has been discontinued, except for routing some of the trains through Allentown and Phoenix. Highways to the north, south, and west are clogged with frantic human traffic, trying to evacuate. Police and army reserves are unable to control the mad flight. By morning, the fugitives will have swelled Philadelphia, Camden, Trenton. It is estimated to be twice their normal population. At this time, martial law prevails through New Jer Jersey and eastern Pennsylvania. We take it now to Washington, D.C. from a word from President Franklin Roosevelt. Citizens of the nation, I shall not try to conceal the gravity of the situation that confronts the country, nor the concern of your government in protecting the lives and property of its people. However, I wish to impress upon you, private civilians and public officials, all of you, the urgent need of calm and resourceful action. Fortunately, this formidable enemy is still confined to a comparatively small area, and we must place our faith in our military forces to keep them there. In the meantime, placing our faith in God, we must continue the performance of our duties, each and every one of us, so that we may confront this destructive adversary with a nation united, courageous and concentrated to the preservation of of human dominance on this earth. I thank you, and please be careful. You have just heard the President of the United States speaking from Washington. Bulletins are too numerous to read and are piling up in the studio here. We are informed the central portion of New Jersey is blacked out from radio communication due to the effect of the heat ray destroying power lines and electrical equipment. Here is a special bulletin from New York. Cables were received from English, French, and German scientists are all off resistance. Astronomers reported continuous gas bursts at regular intervals occurring on the planet Mars. Mass vo majority voice opinion that the enemy will be reinforced by additional rocket machines. Attempts are being made to locate Professor Pearson of Princeton, who observed the Martians at close range. But we have been unsuccessful so far. It is feared he was lost in recent battle. In Langham Field, Virginia, scouting planes report three Martian machines visible above the treetops, moving north towards Somerville with the population fleeing ahead of them. Heat ray not in use, although advancing express train speed, invaders pick their way carefully. They seem to be making a conscious effort to dis avoid destruction of cities and countrysides. 
However, they stopped to uproot power lines, bridges, and railroad tracks. Their apparent objective is to crush residents, paralyze communication, destroy resistance, and disorganize human society. It seems these three machines were two more that came out of the cylinder in Drover's Mill, and all three of them are now currently, as I've said, going across New Jersey. Here's another bulletin from Baskin Ridge, New Jersey. Crude hunters have stumbled on a second cylinder, similarly to the first, embedded in a great swamp, 27 miles south of Morristown. Army field pieces are proceeding from New York to destroy the second invading unit before the cylinder can be opened and the fighting machine rigged. They are taking a position in the foothills of the Watchung Mountains. Another bulletin from Langham Fields, New Gen Virginia. Scouting planes report enemy machines, now three in number, increasing speed northward, destroying houses, taking down trees, and in their evident haste to form a conjunction with their allies south of Morristown. Machines are sighted by telephone operator of Millsex within 10 miles of playing field. Here's a bulletin from Winston Field, Long Island. Fleet of army bombers carrying heavy explosives flying north in pursuit of the three enemy tripods. Scouting planes act as guides. They keep speeding at enemy in sight. Just a moment, please. Ladies and gentlemen, we've run special wires to the artillery line in the adjacent villages to give you direct reports in the zone of the advancing enemy. First, we take you to the second battery of the field artillery located in the Watchton Mountains. Range, 32 meters. 32 meters. Projection, 39 degrees. 39 degrees. Fire! One hundred and four yards to the right, sir. Shift range, thirty-one meters. Thirty-one meters. Projection, thirty-seven degrees. Thirty-seven degrees. Fire! <laughs> hey, sir, we got one of them. They stopped. The others are trying to repair it. Quick, get the range, six thirty meters. Thirty meters. Projection, twenty-seven degrees. 27 degrees. Fire! <laughs> Can't see the shell land, so they're laying off smoke. What is it? The black smoke, so moving this way. Lying close to the ground. It's moving fast. Put on your gas mask. We're over the fire. Shift 24 meters. Army bombing plane, B-843 off Bayonne, New Jersey. Lieutenant Volgant, commanding eight bombers, reporting to the Commander Fairfax, Langham Field. This is Volgant, reporting to the Commander Fairfax, Langham Field, enemy tripod machines now in sight, reinforced by three machines from Mor the Morristown Cylinder, six altogether. One machine already crippled, believe hit by shell from Army gun and watched in the mountains. And now here silent, heavy black fog hanging close to earth. Extreme density. Nature unknown. No sign of a heat ray. And we now turns east. 
crossing the Passaic River into the Jersey Marshes. Another straddles the Pulaski Skyway. Evident the object is New York City. They're heading towards it. They're pushing down a high tension power station. The machines are close together now and we're ready to attack. Plane circling. Ready to strike. Thousand yards. Probably will be over the first. Eight hundred yards. Six hundred. Four hundred. Two hundred. New Jersey, calling to Langham Field. This is Bayon, New Jersey, calling Langham Field. Come in, please. This is Langham Field. Go ahead. Eight Army bombers in engagement with enemy tripod machines over Jersey Flats. Engines destroyed by the heat ray. All airplanes were destroyed. All crashed. One enemy machine was destroyed. Enemy now discharging heavy black smoke in the direction of... This is New York, New Jersey. This New York, New Jersey. Warning. Poisonous black smoke pouring from New Jersey marshes reaches South Street. Gas masks are completely ineffective. Urge population to move into open spaces. Automobiles use Route 72324. Avoid congested areas. Smoke now spreading over Raymond Boulevard. Two X two L calling CQ. Two X two L calling CQ. Two X two L calling eight six three R. Come in, please. This is 8X3R, coming back to you, 2X2L. Where are you, 8X3R? Where, what's the matter, where are you? Ladies and gentlemen, this is the Intercontinental Radio News, back on top of our broadcasting building in New York City. The bells you can hear are ringing to warn people to evacuate the city as the Martians approach. I can see from the roof up here, people evacuating in all directions of traffic. Estimated in the last two hours, three million people have moved out along the roads to the north. Hutchinson River Parkway still kept open for motor traffic. Avoid bridges to Long Island. Hopelessly jammed. All communication with Jersey Shore closed 10 minutes ago. No more defenses. Our own army's been wiped out. Artillery, Air Force, everything's been destroyed. This may be the last broadcast. N not just for our country, but for maybe the entire world. You'll stay here till the end. People are holding service below us in the cathedral. They're, they're praying. A miracle. Now I look down at the harbor. All manner of boats overloaded with the fleeing population pulling out from the docks. Streets are like streets are all jammed. Noisy crowds like New Year's Eve in the city. Wait a minute, I can see the enemy in sight. Uh, above the Hudson River. Five. Five great flying machines. The first one's crossing the river. I can see it from here. Waiting over the Hudson like a man wading through a brook. A bulletin. Martian cylinders are falling all over the country. I just got this bulletin. One outside Buffalo, one in Chicago, St. Louis. Seem to be time and space. Now, the first machine reaches the store. He, he's blasting the buildings with the heat ray. He stands watching, looking over the city. His steel polished head is even with the skyscrapers. Holy God, I can hear the screams of the terrified people below as they run blindly away from this monster. He waits, he's waiting for the others. They rise in a line of new towers on the city's west side. Now they're lifting up their metal hands. 
This is the end now. The firing of gun blast of smoke from this gun like tube. And this black smoke is exploding. It's drifting over the city. People into the streets, I see it now. They're, they're running towards the east river, thousands of them. And it's, they're dropping like rats. They're running like rats. Now the smoke is spreading faster. It's reached Times Square. People are trying to run away from it, but it's it's no use. They're falling like flies. They're, now there's smoke crossing the 6th Avenue, 5th Avenue, 1, 100th Avenue. Get some 50 feet away. Come on. This is... This is Howard Jefferson. Connect. Goodbye. Two X two O, call in CQ. Two X two O, call in CQ. Two X two O, call in CQ. New York. Isn't there anyone on the air? Is there anyone? Act Two, Earth Under the Martians. As I set these notes on paper, I'm obsessed by the thought that I may be the last living man on Earth. I have been hiding in this empty house near Grover's Mill, a small island of daylight cut off by the black smoke from the rest of the world. All that happened before the arrival of these monstrous creatures and the world that now seems part of another life, a life that has no continuity with the present. The future existence of the lonely derelict whose pencils these words on the back of some astronomical notes bearing the signature of Richard Pearson. I look down at my blackened hands, my torn shoes, my tattered clothes, and try to connect them with a professor who lives in Princeton and who on the night of October 30th glimpsed through his telescope an orange splash of light on a distant planet. My wife, my colleagues, my students, my books, my observatory, my, my world. Where are they? Did they ever exist? Am I Richard Pearson? What day is it? Do days exist without calendars? Does time pass when there are no human hands left to wind the clocks? In writing down my daily life, I tell myself I shall preserve human history between the dark covers of this little book that was meant to record the movements of the stars. But to write, I must live, and to live, I must eat. I find moldy bread in the kitchen and an orange not too spoiled to swallow. I keep watch at the window. From time to time I catch sight of a Martian above the black smoke. The smoke still holds the house in its black coil, but at length there is a hissing sound, and suddenly I see a Martian mounted on his machine, spraying the air with a jet of steam, as if to dissipate the smoke. I watch in a corner as the huge metal legs nearly brush against the house. Exhausted by terror, I fall asleep. Before I know it, it's morning. Morning. The only part of the day I like so far now. Sun streams in the window. The black cloud of gas has lifted 
and the scorched meadows to the north look as though a black snowstorm had passed over them. On one day, I decided to venture from the house. I make my way to a road. No traffic. Here and there, a wrecked car, baggage overturned, a blackened skeleton. I push on north. For some reason, I feel safer trailing these monsters than running away from them. And I keep a careful watch. I have seen the Martians feed. Should one of their machines appear over the top of the trees, I am ready to fling myself flat on the earth. I come to a chestnut tree. October chestnuts are ripe. I fill my pockets. I must keep alive. Two days I wander in a vague northerly direction through a desolate world. Finally, I notice a living creature. A tiny red squirrel in a beech tree. I stare at him and wonder. He stares back at me. I believe at that moment... The animal and I shared the same emotion, the joy of finding another living being. I pushed on north. I find dead cows in a brackish field. Beyond the charred ruins of their bodies, the silo remains standing guard over the wasteland like a lighthouse deserted by the sea. Astride the silo perches a weathercock. The arrow points north. Next day, I came to a city vaguely familiar in its contours, yet its buildings strangely dwarfed and leveled off, as if a giant hand sliced off the highest towers with caprasic sweeps of the hand. I reached the outskirts. I found Newark, undemolished, but humbled by some whim of the advancing Martians. Presently, With an odd feeling of being watched, I caught sight of something crouching in a doorway. I may have stepped towards it, and it rose up and became a man. A man armed with a large knife. Stop. Where did you come from? I I come from many places. A long time ago from Princeton. Princeton, eh? That's near Grover's Mill, where this old mess started. Yes. Grover's Mill. (laughs) <laughs> There's no food here, unfortunately. This is my territory. All this end of town down to the river. There's only food for one. Which way are you going? I don't know. I guess I'm, I'm just looking for people. What was that? Did you hear something just then? Only a bird. Whoa. Now I just realized a live bird. You get to know that bird have shadows these days. It's hard to see living creatures around these parts. Seems like the whole earth has been snuffed out. Say, we're in the open here. Let's crawl crawl into this doorway and talk. Have you seen any Martians? Nah, they've gone over to what remains of New York City. At night, the sky is alive with their lights, just as if... People were still living in it. By daylight, you can't see them. Five days ago, a couple of them carried something big across the flats from the airport. I believe they are beginning to fly. Fly? Yeah, fly. Then it's all over for humanity. If they continue to fly, they'll conquer the world. There's still you and I, two of us left. They got themselves in solid. They wrecked the grayest country in the world. Those green stars, they're probably falling somewhere every night. And they've only lost one machine. There isn't anything to do. We're done. We're licked. Where were you? You're in a uniform. Yeah, what's left of it. I was in the militia, National Guard. That's good. Wasn't any war any more than there was war between men and ants. And were eatable ants. I found that out. 
What will they do with us? I thought it all out. Right now, we're caught as we wanted. The Martian only has to go a few miles to get a crowd on the run. But they won't keep doing that. They'll begin catching us systematically, like keeping the beast and storing us in cages and things, laying traps and catching us hundreds at a time. They haven't begun on us yet. Not begun? Not begun! All that's happened so far is because we don't have sense enough to keep quiet, bothering them with guns and such stuff and losing our heads and rushing off in crowds. Now, instead of our rushing around blind, we've got to fix ourselves up. Fix ourselves up according to the way things are now. Cities, nations, civilization, progress. They're all extinct. But if that's so, what is there to live for? Well, there won't be any more concerts for a million years or so. And no nice little diners at restaurants. If it's amusement you're after... I guess the game's up. And what is there left? Life! That's what! I want to live, and so do you! We're not going to be exterminated, fattened up like cattle, and turned into slaves. And I don't mean to be caught either. Tamed, fattened, and bred like an ox. All of that. What are you going to do? I'm going on. Right under their feet. I got a plan. We men as men are finished. We don't know enough. We got we got to learn plenty before we got a chance. And we've got to live and keep free while we learn. See? I thought it all out. Tell me the rest. Well, it isn't all of us that were made for wild beasts. And that's what it's got to be. That's why I watched you. All these little office workers that used to live in these houses, they'd be no good. They haven't any stuff to them. They just used to run off to work. I've seen hundreds of them running to catch their commuter train in the morning for fear they'd get canned if they didn't. Running back at night afraid they won't be back in time for dinner. Lives insured and li- little invested in case of accidents. On Sundays, worried about the hereafter. The Martians will be a godsend for those guys. Nice roomy cages, good food, wonderful breeding, no worries. After a week or so chasing about the fields on empty stomachs, they'll come and be glad to be caught. You thought it all out, haven't you? You bet I have, and that isn't all. The Martians will make pets out of some of them. Train them to do the tricks, who knows? It gets sentimental over the pet boy who grew up and had to be killed. And some, maybe they'll... Train them to hunt us. No, that that's impossible. No human being. Yes, they will. There's men who would gladly do it, even out of desperation. If one of them ever comes after me, why? In the meantime, you and I, others like us, where are we to live when the Martians own the earth? I figured it all out. We'll live underground. I've been thinking about the sewers under New York, miles of them. The main ones are big enough for anybody. There are cellars, vaults, underground storerooms, railway tunnels, subways. You begin to see, eh? And we'll get a bunch of strong men together. No weak ones. That rubbish, out. And you meant me to go? Well, I gave you a chance, didn't I? We won't quarrel about that. Go on. And we've got to make safe plans for us to stay in, see? And we could get all the books. Science books. That's where men like you come in, see? We'll raid museums, even spy on the Martians. It won't, may not be so much we have to learn before. Just imagine this. Four or five fighting machines suddenly start off, heat rays right and left, and not a Martian in them. Not a Martian, but us, but men. If we take down a fighting machine, men who have learned the way how, we can build our own. It may even be in our time. Gee, imagine having one of those lovely things with its heat ray wide and free. We'll turn it on the Martians. We bring them down to their knees. That's your plan? You and me? A few more of us? We'd save the world. I see. What's the matter? Where are you going? I have to go on. I'm afraid I can't be part of this world. 
Goodbye. After parting with the artillerymen, I came at last to the Holland Tunnel. I entered that silent tube, anxious to know the fate of the great city on the other side of the Hudson. Cautiously, I came out of the tunnel and made my way up Canal Street. I reached 14th Street, and there again was black powder and several bodies, and an evil ominous smell from the gratings of the cellars from some of the houses. I wandered up through the 30s and 40s, and I stood alone in Times Square. I caught sight of a lean dog running down 7th Avenue with a piece of dark brown meat in his jaws, a pack of starving mongrels at his heels. He made a wide circle around me, as though he feared I might prove a fresh competitor. I walked up Broadway in the direction of the strange powder, past silent shop windows displaying their mute wares to empty sidewalks. Past the Capitol Theater, silent, dark, past the shooting gallery where a row of empty guns faced an arrested line of wooden ducks. Near Columbus Circle, I noticed models of 1939 motor cars in the showrooms facing the empty streets. From over the top of the General Motors building, I watched a flock of blackbirds circling in the sky. I hurried on. Suddenly, I caught sight of the hood of a Martian machine, staying somewhere in Rec- Central Park gleaming in the late afternoon sun. An insane idea resolved me. I rushed recklessly across Columbus Circle and into the park. I, I climbed up a small hill above the pond at 60th Street. From there, I could see, standing in a silent row along the mall, 19 of those great metal titans, their cowls empty, their great steel arms hanging listlessly by their sides. I looked in vain for the monsters that inhabit those machines. Suddenly, my eyes were attracted to the immense flock of black birds that hovered directly below me. They circled to the ground, and there before my eyes, stark and silent, lay the Martians, with the hungry birds pecking and tearing brown shreds of flesh from their dead bodies. Later, Their bodies were examined in laboratories. It was found out that they were killed by the putrative and disease bacteria against which their systems were completely unprepared. Slain, after all man's devices has failed, by the humblest things that God in his wisdom put upon this earth. Eventually, the pulse of life grew stronger again, and humanity rebuilt to what it was once before. Before the cylinder fell, there was a general persuasion that through all of deep space, no life existed beyond the pretty surface of our miniature sphere. Now we see further. Dim and wonderful is the vision I have conjured up in my mind of life spreading slowly from this little seed bed of this solar system throughout the inanimate vastness of side real space. But that is a remote dream. It may be the destruction of the Martians, which is only a reprieve. To them, and not to us, is the future ordained, perhaps. Strange, and now seems to sit peacefully in my study at Princeton, writing down this last chapter of the record I began at the desert farm and grower's mill. Strange to see from my window the university spires dim and blue through an April haze. Strange to watch children playing the streets again. Strange to see young people strolling on the green where the new spring grass heals the last black scars of a bruised earth. Strange to watch the sightseers enter the museum where the disassembled parts of the Martian fighting machines are kept on public view to honor those who were lost in the great holocaust. Strange when I recall the time when I first saw it, bright and clean cut, hard and silent, under the dawn of that last great day. This Logan Gregor, 
out of character to assure you that the War of the Worlds has no further significance than as the holiday offering it was intended to be. This is Xylo Productions' remake of the Mercury Theater's own radio version of dressing up in a sheet, jumping off a bush, and saying boo. Starting now, we couldn't soap all your windows and steal all your garden gates by tomorrow night, so we did the next best thing. We annihilated the world before your very years and utterly destroyed the CBS. You will be relieved, I hope, to learn that we didn't mean it and that both institutions are still open for business. So have a great night, everybody, and remember the giant lesson you've learned tonight. That grinning, glowing, globular invader of your living room is not a fighting machine, but it's an inhabitant of the pumpkin patch. And if your doorbell rings and nobody's there, it's not Martian, it's Halloween. <laughs>